All right. I am so excited to be back again with Portia Monberg and Pippa Shaw. And we are talking, continuing the conversations that we've been having about pricing in the surface pattern design industry. And if you haven't seen, we've done two videos about this so far, chatting about our experiences in the industry. And, you know, um, the first uh, video that we did, we talked about three things that we want to know before we even talk about numbers. We want people to know. And those three things are um, that your work has value you know, so don't forget that before you start pricing, um, that there's always room for negotiation and there's ways that you can, you know, negotiate your, your terms. And, and so that's the second thing. And then the third thing that we talked about, um, being important is, is remembering to sort of zoom out and, and think about the long-term sustainability of what you're asking for in a price for both your career and for the industry in general. And, after that first chat, we had a second chat where we kind of dove into about work having value. And today we are here to dive into um, talking about the second point, which was negotiation. And I'm really excited to chat with you ladies about this. So thank you for coming back here. Um, so the first thing that I was thinking when, now I'm not like, I, I mean, I don't think any of us are high pressure negotiation, you know, like wizards or anything like that. I'm certainly not, but... Um, I have learned a few things as I've, you know, negotiated my fees over the years. And the first thing that I think it's important that everyone who might be watching this knows is negotiation is part of the process, right? Some people are too nervous to, you know, they say when they get a client who gives them their budget or their information, you know, like what they're planning to pay for this project, they think that if they come back with a counter offer that's being problematic that's being someone who's like difficult to work with or something that's simply not true does anyone have any thoughts around that that point yeah i definitely see a lot of newer designers thinking there must be a fixed price you know for whatever it is and having no confidence about negotiating what they think is the right price or just being completely lost you know about what the industry is there an industry standard and you know what questions to ask and they're so excited about maybe getting their first client they're too scared to say anything because they don't want to lose them you know so but you definitely are expected to negotiate yeah a hundred percent and I feel like I mean I've heard stories even where I've heard stories from the side of an art director where an art director has said, I'm not allowed to, you know, give you the top of my budget. Like, you know, I've heard these stories of like, you know, let's say we have between 600 and a thousand dollars to do this project. I have to say $600 is our budget. I, I'm not allowed to say up to a thousand dollars but I'm always hoping that they come back because they're like, want you to win. You know, it's like, I'm always hoping they come back and say, well, I can't do it for under 800 or 900. And then I can say, okay, but I'm not allowed to like offer that. So keep that in mind. Like, imagine if you're thinking that this is, you know, the best you're going to do is whatever their first offer is, but they are really not, I mean, of course, not everyone is going to be like this, but I have heard examples of people who are like, oh man, I wish that person had the, like, you know, the confidence to come back and, and counter, counteract or counter offer because we have more money. I just can't tell you that, you know? Right. So how do you handle negotiation when they ask you to come up with a price? Because this is definitely something that's happened to me where they say, what do you charge for this pattern? Mm, that's tricky. Um, well, I mean, I I usually kind of try to give a range. Like, are, are, are you talking about an example of when someone has picked something that you've already designed and wants to buy it outright? Yes, not a work for hire situation, mm -hmm. but a you. I saw this pattern on your Instagram. Would like to purchase it. What is what's the fee? Yeah. Uh, so I don't do a lot of that myself. Um, I don't really do outright of something that I've already, already exists. 
Um, but my, I mean, Pippa, jump in if you have advice, but my thought would be asking some questions as to what, you know, what it's going to be used for. Because another, you know, thing that we talk about when we talk about negotiation is what kind of, not just the actual number fee at the end of the day, but what kind of rights are you including with that number mm -hmm. fee? So if they're asking to buy it outright and own all the copyright, um, you know, having some information about what potential products it might go on um, could be, be helpful. Um, or, and in that case, I would probably try to offer some sort of like tiered pricing, mm -hmm. which is another technique, right? So something where you say, if you want to, um, you know, have a, you want to license it for two years in your category, it's this much, let's say $600. This is just random, depending on whatever. If you want to license it for all categories for two years, it's $800. If you want to buy it outright and do whatever you want with it for the rest of your life, it's $1,200 or something like mm -hmm. that, right? Right. So giving those options shows that then something, the more affordable option keeps your rights and keeps, you know, limits things so that you can reuse it and hopefully make more money off that same pattern. Um, but hopefully, you know, they can see the value of, you know, if they're really budget conscious, they can do something lower um, and just have those limited rights. But if they really want to own it and whatever, then they're going to have to pay, pay something that, you know, you're more comfortable with. Yeah. In my most recent situation, I ended up coming back to them and saying, what do you typically pay for mm -hmm. patterns? And then I did, as you described, and gave them like a tiered package. Nice. So Were I think happy? we ended up, um, yeah, it was fine, but we ended up, I think at the number that they initially threw out is what they chose. Mm, gotcha. It was fine. I mean, I was okay with it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, what do you, I, sorry, go ahead. I always, a second. no, 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 the first thing I always ask is when people say they want to purchase all the rights, I just check that they really do want to purchase all the rights because everyone thinks they want, they want to buy, you know, the copyright outright, but then it turns out they only want to use it on bikinis for two years and, you know, I can do them a good deal and they get to have the exclusivity they want, you know, everything's negotiable and then I get to, use you know keep the design and use it for something else and it might have been a design that I wasn't willing to sell the copyright for that you know I could go into those reasons later but um you know that everything is negotiable and just never be afraid to ask questions and especially people who are newer newer businesses smaller businesses they've read something about licensing or buy you know fashion buyouts or something like that and you know that's all their knowledge base is and sometimes we have to help you know them understand how how the industry can work and work best for them because then they're spending less money to get what they want right so i think when we're talking about that those kind of either buyouts or licensing we're usually talking about a flat fee license right because a lot of these businesses so the difference between a flat fee license and a royalty-based license is for anyone who might be watching is you know a royalty based license is when you're getting a certain percentage of the sales that they make on their products so you use your artwork for a greeting card and you're getting five percent on all the greeting cards they sell throughout whatever but that kind of um payout scheme requires a lot of sort of paperwork basically and and for them to have their back end all set up for that sort of um, model, which is many small businesses who might reach out to you on Instagram or whatever might not have that kind of um, capabilities. So instead you can say a, a flat fee, like I said, something like $600 or $800 or something um, for whatever amount of rights that you're willing to get. And so it doesn't matter if they sell 12 cards or if they sell 17 billion cards, as long as it's within the like the terms of, of what you guys have agreed to, you're still getting that flat fee. Um, and, and so then those terms that you can, can negotiate around, um, if anyone has some to throw out, I'm thinking like usually time limit is, is a part of the terms. Um, 
uh, category. So is it just for greeting cards? Is it just for all stationary products like paper products, but someone else could use it for wall art? Is it just for, you know, what is the category that this um, is being used for? Um, Geographical area as well. If you can limit it to North America or Europe, you know, then you might find someone in Australia who only sells in Australia that or the Far East or mm. South America. Yeah. And they're not competing. So, you know. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, yeah, time limit. Exclusivity, not, you know, it's another thing, you know, how much exclusivity is kind of similar to the categories, but. Yeah, so can you, like exclusivity, can you give a little more information about that? Like I, I have that written down too, but I'm also like, what is, it just basically no one else can use. Yeah, can so if a fabric, say for fabric, you could have exclusivity just for quilting fabric, and then you're free to license the same design for say someone who makes a uh, bag accessories because it's not quilting fabric. So gotcha. the, the more you can hone down and, you know, I have found that, I mean, I do license a lot of designs for fabric and people do seem to like, you know, certain designs for, for fabric products. So it's nice. Or you can, you know, like I will say just for my personal kind of thing, I've already done license this colorway for, for quilting fabric, but I'll make you a new colorway that you can use so that it's different and you won't have anyone worry about anyone making bags, you know, with the, the fabric they bought uh, mm. off the bolt. And then you've got something that's unique to you, even though it's something that's already been licensed. And most people are happy. I mean, some companies, you know, they, they have their reasons, especially bigger companies, they you know have their reasons for needing to be exclusive, but smaller companies are usually happy that they get something that's special and exclusive to them. And yeah. So exclusivity can range from little tiny things to every product in the world for the next few years. And, and you know, the more you can hone it down, the, the better, because it gives you more opportunities. Right. Um, and the other things that besides, I think those are probably the main, like exclusivity, which I think is kind of basically category. Um, mm -hmm. territory and time limit are some of the main things that you can negotiate as far as like the licensing part of it, but other things that you can negotiate with your price can be other certain benefits like addition, like samples, getting samples and how many samples you get, um, or negotiating something where you can get, let's say three samples, but but then you have the ability to buy the item wholesale pricing so that you could sell it on your own like Etsy shop or something like that. And it's something with your art. Um, and there are other, has anyone heard of any other kind of benefits that could come with a some sort of deal that you might be negotiating? I think social yeah, I media exposure. Yeah, marketing, yeah. Social, yeah. so you're meaning that um, they're going to, that the brand would talk about you would talk about you being the artist yes so yeah. you know so many mentions on social media if they show the product with your pattern on it or your design on it then they have to mention you and tag you and stuff like and tag that you. Yeah. yeah exactly gotcha so I think any kind of promotional you know and I also think you can negotiate um just using your name in general right you know, true a the lot of right yeah. 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 A lot of companies aren't going to use your name. They're just going to anonymously use it. So, and that's something that may not cost them financially to do. So it's a good thing to consider. Yeah. Um, and even but, if it's, yeah. oh, sorry, go ahead, Pippa. No, no, I was saying when you get very successful, it works the other way around, you know, they're going to pay you to, you know, use your trademark and your, you know, have you promote the, the product. So it's a kind of long-term pipeline but you got to sort of keep an eye on things like that for the future as well if you're trying to build a brand yeah so there we yes yeah, so that's that's those are all great points and the copyright thing is is important too yes whether your name is going to be on it or not on it and you know how that's going to be displayed is it going to be a little just a little tiny note on the back of the tag or is it going to be like a 
this is a collaboration, you know, like big header on the, on the packaging or something like that. And most likely it's going to be a little, you know, unless you're a bigger name, it's most likely going to just be a little note, but there's a difference even, I mean, it does, it makes a difference between having your name on the back of a card and not having it, you know, it's, it's just for our own personal egos, I think, whether or not that's like really getting your name yeah. out there, maybe not, but um, so those are all things. Yeah, if you have an Etsy shop, I've had a few people who've received a card which had my details on the back and then they've looked me up online and then they found I had an Etsy shop and then they've said, oh yeah, I found, you know, someone sent me a card with you. Oh, that's awesome. That with you. Yeah, so that's nice, you know, that just, you know, it does work and it is nice that it can, can get you some extra, yeah. extra you it's know, extra just sales, but you know, just not, it's, it's kind of a boost to know that people re like your work enough to look you up online. Yeah, definitely. Um, so negotiation, just recapping so far, negotiation is definitely part of the process. Don't be shy about it. You know, don't think that like whatever the first thing that comes out means you have to go with that. Um, and then, you know, one thing, the, the biggest thing that you can negotiate besides the, the number actually going up and down of your pricing is terms. So if there's, if, if you're getting, you know, the, the pushback that our budget is our budget, it is, you know, $800, we can't go higher, we can't go lower. Think about what can you, yeah, what, what kind of rights can you restrict in order to make that work for what you want to work for? Um, or what kind of bonuses can you add in, aka extra samples or some sort of, you know, wholesaling deal that can make that $800 or whatever it is stretch in a way that's going to be beneficial for you, right? Um, so as far as negotiating, I, one other tip that I, I is so important is is having that confidence in your language and and your approach um most of the time i feel like these type of negotiations happen via email and you can edit your emails as much as you wanted to you know what i mean you don't have to it's one thing when you're talking talking you know face to face and then you it's really hard to sort of maybe hold your ground or whatever but on email you can edit your words to be perfect and so um i always recommend to my start your service pattern business students my favorite plugin um, for gmail is called just not sorry if you Google just not sorry plugin, it's something that you can um, like install on your like Chrome or in your Gmail or whatever. And basically what it does is when you're typing an email, it will underline wishy-washy words basically. Um, so if you say, I think it would be great if, it will underline the I think. If you say, I'm sorry to bother you, but, it will underline the, I'm sorry, you know what I mean? That kind of thing. And this plugin is like, I love this plugin. Um, I recommend it to, yeah, anyone just not sorry plugin. And so you can write an email and, and you'll find out, you'll realize, like my students have told me, like, I had no idea how much I said just, like, I'm just checking Dude. in. I just wanted to know. I just wanted to show you. It's like, I had no idea how much I kind of qualify my language and and it's just a little reminder it will underline it and remind you and it, you know it doesn't go through to the person even if you decide to stick with that language it, you know they're not going to see it but it's just it's like a little like tap like hey p.s you could say this in a stronger way which i absolutely love and even when i'm dealing with clients that i'm i'm like been you know talking with for five years who i've been working with for five years and i'm sending them you know like i'm sending them my next draft I'll send a thing and like, oh, I just wanted to check in. Here's what I've been doing. And then it's like, I could just say that it's okay to be a little wishy-washy when I'm sending a draft, but I don't, I see it and I edit it out. And it's like, here's what I've got. Tell me what you think, like whatever, you know, whatever it is, but why not be more uh, forthright and forthcoming um, at, at, at any opportunity, but certainly for negotiation. So um, does anyone have any 
like tips around sort of, yeah, negotiation language or, or just like tips around sort of being more confident in your negotiation? Go ahead, I just saying I've got it what I find helpful is like I've got a list of questions you know that I usually ask you know and then obviously I tailor them to the specific request but it's just really helpful to have a template list of questions that you can just cut and paste rather than having to go through it every time and you know spending a lot of time on it and then obviously you can tweak them as you go along to you know make the language more confident as uh, Elizabeth has suggested and it just goes to show as well if the client is, com is uh, someone worth spending time with as well because if they can't even be bothered to answer your questions and that's kind of a bit of a red flag if they just come back and go I just want to know the price you know so if they're a professional they will be used to answering those kind of questions and they if they don't have all the answers, then obviously, you know, that's fine, but they'll give you an idea or they'll explain why, you know, so that's just a, a good tip. I love that. Pippo, can you give us some examples of what kind of questions you have? Like just, you know. Yeah, just off the top of my head, the things we've discussed, you know, like how long, you know, do, well, the main one is, do you really need all the rights if they ask, you know, they want to buy something? I was like, do you, you know, what products do you want this for? You know, how, how do you normally work with, other artists you know as in royalties or flat fees or mm. if they're a new business as well I got a different set of questions you know just to make sure that they're realistic because you can have a lot of back and forth you know with someone you know and then you find out their budget's a hundred dollars and no you want to find that out at the beginning because you're wasting their time and you're wasting your time so right you know it's respectful of each other and if they've got less experience too sometimes you know you do have to take some time to educate them and you kind of you know, you get a feeling, you know, if, if it's a good fit for you, you know, how enthusiastic they are if, and if they really want to work with you or if they just saw the pattern and, you know, you know, then they go, oh, I've seen stuff on Creative Market for like $10, you're like, mm. oh, that was you know? So normally if it's a small business, a good one to ask is, you know, like, what's your budget? And if they, you know, really are starting out and don't have a massive budget, then, you know, I say to them, well, if you go to these kinds of places, like, you can find things in that price range but you know just be aware that you're not going to have anyone you know everybody can use them and you know you're not going to have the designer be able to make color changes for you or you know adapt it for your product or you know it's kind of like you get what you pay for in a lot mm. of respects so, things like that yeah that makes sense i love that um how about you portia any oh, yeah any Oh, the only thing I had to add is just to take the pressure off a little bit. Just think of it as a conversation. You know, it doesn't have to be mm. do or die. You know, it's you're just having a conversation. Totally. That's really good. I One artist that I uh, talked to um, who was working with a, sort of a bigger brand, um, I was asking her sort of behind the scenes what, you know, what she ended up getting for that deal. And she was saying that they offered her something, you know, not great. And she had the, I think it was like her, her partner or something suggested, but was like, basically you should get on the phone with them because it's a lot harder to kind of say no to someone like when you're talking, you know, like we do everything mm -hmm. via email and that's good and bad. The, the good part is we can yeah. create, craft our response and we can be very deliberate and, and not have to, you know, have that immediate pressure, but it also means they don't have to have yeah. the immediate pressure. They can just dismiss your, you know, dismiss your thing and just kind of whatever, not really um, be put on the spot about making any sort of decisions. So um, she actually got on the phone. She was like, oh, can we just chat about this? You know, I'd love to just chat about it. And so she actually got on the phone with them and was able to get double what they had originally offered. Um, wow. So, you know, again, I, I feel like the advice we get about negotiating is sort of that, that I've heard for like real life negotiating, face-to-face -face negotiating, like when you're interviewing for a job or anything like that is sort of be comfortable with silence, be comfortable with putting out what you want and then stepping back. Cause if you kind of double back and say, I was thinking, you know, 
$2,000. And then you're like, if they don't say anything right away and you're like, but I mean, if you think that this, then, you know, you start double, you know, you start like, uh, you know, making it harder for yourself. So if you think that you can handle saying, I, I was thinking $2,000 and then being quiet until you actually hear what they have to say, um, then maybe the phone route could be a way to sort of put a little bit of pressure on, on them to um, respond to you as like a human rather than just an email, you know, so. That's another little tip. And don't be afraid to walk away if the deal, you know, just even if you're spending, you know, a few emails going back and forth, you know, if it's if they're lowballing you, just you know, don't be afraid to walk away because the chances are in two weeks' time someone will contact you and you know maybe want the same thing and want to pay you more for it, and then you'll be so pleased that that you made that decision. Yes, that is so true. That's such a good point because I know we, especially as we're starting out, it's like every client is, is do or die as, as you were saying, Portia. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it feels like this is, the, this is the make or break of my career. Like this is my first paying job, my second paying job, whatever it is, it feels super important. And it's not to say that it isn't. Um, and I always am sort of upfront that when I started freelancing, I for sure, accepted low, you know, very low fees. Um, and so, I mean, there's a certain amount of, if you're a beginner and, and you need to, you know, if you want to get a little experience by accepting a, a lower fee, that's your business. And I, I personally, am not going to judge you for it, but, um, however, um, you know, every, there are more jobs out there and there is, you know, there are times when walking away really is, um, you know, the thing that you need to do. And one like meme that I've seen on Instagram, which is like super, super true <laughs> is like, uh, is like a thing of like the $500 client. And then it's like, this $500 is like my heart and soul. Like we really have to figure out how we're going to work together with this and make sure that we get exactly what we want and blah, blah, blah. And then it's like the $5,000 client cool money sent. Like, you know, it's true. It's like, if it's it, the higher like roller clients, like they didn't need less from you there. It's not, it's a small portion of their budget and they are less, um, you know, kind of detailed and obsessed about like every little thing. And it, and remembering that, you know, is, is a big part of, of being able to walk away when the price is low. Well, I do think a lot of times the smaller clients maybe have more personal energy invested in it. And so they can be very micromanagey, whereas the bigger clients are generally larger companies. They have a little more distance from the project. Um, so, yeah, I agree. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, and, you know, and sometimes you get smaller clients and actually it's they have such a clear vision of what they want and it can work out really well it can be really great you know because you know you kind of go back and forth and you create something that's you know special because it's their business their livelihood their their baby you know whereas and so they can put more in so it's not always a negative thing i don't want people to think that small clients uh, True. you know it can you know and it can provide, you know, like the final products can make you look so much better and so much more professional because, you know, they really have put everything in it and something you can be super proud of because, you know, the quality, you know, every little last detail has been worked on by the client in the same way as they worked on the design with you. So it's not always a negative. Yeah, that's and the true. Way, yeah, it goes, goes the same for um, if people push you to sell your copyright and it's, a design that you don't want to sell the copyright of. I think we mentioned this before briefly. Like I have certain signature designs that I just wouldn't ever sell because I know that I can license them in lots of different categories. And, you know, it's just every now and then there's a, something that's really special. And also like my, my business is mainly based around licensing and building a brand. So if you, you know, just, don't feel, you know, I've had a few people trying to push me into selling a copyright on something I wasn't happy with. And actually in the end, we, we nearly always, I think only one time it didn't work because, you know, that was the way their company worked and, you know, they couldn't change the rules. But every other time we managed to agree to an exclusive license, you know, so there's usually room for negotiation. Mm. 
I love that. Pippa, do you find with those smaller clients where you've had success that they can pay relatively well though? Yeah, it depends how established they are, I guess. It, it, and, you know, and also what country they're in and where they're selling, you know, because obviously different things cost different amounts. Um, but yeah. And sometimes you can work with big companies and, you know, it's a royalty percentage and it can be really disappointing. So, you know, yeah. it's, that's true. And you don't know what's going on as well, internal politics, you know, like a company with a really, really great name. And you don't know that they were recently bought out by a venture capital company that's really squeezing every last penny out. And a lot of them, you know, really great staff have left. And, you know, you're all excited, you know, you've got this big new client and they're going to pay you royalties. And then, you know, six months later, you get your first royalty check and you're a bit like, oh, OK, you know, it's yeah. swings around a bit. It really is. It's a roller coaster. Like that's the one thing that you know. And then you get these unexpected surprises sometimes too. So that's true. That is really true. And one thing as well that made me think of is you know we're always so nervous to put a big figure out there. Like I'm, I'm great when you know when you're advising friends and everything. But when it's you and you're like, oh my god, but they're a small business and oh I don't want to you know. And then you know we all go through that, but you you kind of know like if you say a number and they say yes straight away, then you should have asked for more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a good reminder for next time for sure. It's but, true. You know. If they say yes right away, that's yeah. Uh, pretty much all like I mean everyone for everything could stand to <laughs> pretty much double their prices, I'm sure, but um but yeah, sort of that's the other thing with with pricing and negotiation is is sort of you know, if every time you have a new client add a little bit you know it's it shouldn't be it shouldn't it doesn't have to be the same for everyone everyone doesn't have to get the same price you can you just add fifty dollars every time if that's it you know just mm -hmm. see and then when you get to a point where you start getting um more you know that's advice i've heard as well is like pitching you know or, or coming up with a, a quote for for different projects if you get to you know if everyone's always saying yes and you're always working with those clients it's like well that's great but that means your pricing is too low like you should be getting to a point where you are quoting and you're only getting about 50 percent yeses um because that's that's the point where you're at that right price where you're mm. um you know basically as high as you can kind of go and some people will go for it and some people won't and, and that's okay and that's where you're getting rid of those smaller clients that are um you know maybe more problematic and and you're getting into the place where your work um is having the value that you want it to so that's something to remember every time you learn i mean it's just a learning process and mm -hmm. You know, there's always a situation that comes along that's different and new and, you know, and then that's why it's good as well to have a friends, a group of other designers here at the same kind of stage as you, or a little bit more experienced or less experienced and you can help them. But, you know, the more we share, the more we learn, you know, exactly. the less mistakes we can help, you know, help other people avoid the mistakes that we've made or give them the confidence to ask for what they should be asking for it's it's a great community that's one thing is yeah really great that community. is true and people are really happy to help if they have the time you know obviously not everyone has the time all the time but yeah stronger team which I didn't even bring up at the beginning of this video, but the reason that we started all chatting is because Portia had started a Facebook group called Fair Pricing for Surface Pattern Designers. So if you're looking for a little bit of community or someone to bounce your, your pricing off of, um, definitely I will leave the link to that in the description. Go check out that Facebook group because we have a lot of um, pattern designers in there who um, are happy to you know, jump in and answer any questions if they can. With lots of different experience too. Like exactly. really, I'm amazed at all the different experience there is in the group. And and as we find out seeing people, like the things people are quoting for are so specific. So as you were just saying, Pippa, like there's not, you're never going to be at a point that it's just easy and second nature. You know what I mean? It's everything is something super specific. And, and, and that's why, um, I like how we are approaching pricing right now with these conversations, less about the numbers. And I understand that numbers are important and I like to be transparent as I can be. Um, you know, it, it's, numbers are important. However, 
having all that sort of the background knowledge about negotiation, about understanding how valuable our work actually is, about how the long-term sustainability of various pricing, that is what sets you up for be a, being able to handle these kind of situations where it's super specific. It's like, this is a wallpaper company and they only sell to hotels, but there's only three hotels. It's a boutique hotel and they don't, they want you to change the colors, but everything else is something you own. And like, you know, there's like, the, there's always these like millions of caveats that seem to make a difference in pricing, but I mean, does it really, I don't know, as you get more comfortable with like what you're, what you're willing to do. And as you practice it, um, you know, you just sort of give it a shot. I feel like it's, it's all a shot in the dark to some degree, you know? So there's, oh, yeah. there's no like magic formula, unfortunately, if there was, I'd tell you what it was. But. Yeah. If people tell you that formula then be suspicious because yeah you know, there's so variables it would be impossible you'd have a spreadsheet like the biggest spreadsheet in the world to take into account I mean obviously there's some general rules and like say you know there's certain categories where they seem to have kind of standard pricing but then when you actually look at their specific requirements then you know they're not always the standard for the standard you know like Right. And I think the goal of the fair pricing group is to look at is, is what is standard actually fair? You know, is, mm -hmm. is it long-term sustainability just because everybody in the industry of whatever, I don't know, shower caps is selling their prints for $300. Does that mean it's sustainable? Um, how many shower caps can you really ever sell in your whole life? You know, I don't know. So um, that's, that's what we're trying to take a look at as well. Um, going back to, to the negotiating, does anyone have any other tips about the actual like, you know, back and forth emails? Um, one that I was just thinking of is remembering and, and feeling confident to follow up. If you send out your counter offer and then you don't hear anything, don't make assumptions. Don't assume that, oh, they clearly ghosted me. They don't want, they're not going to be, they think it's too much, whatever it is. Don't, don't ever make that assumption. Um, you need to follow up once, potentially twice, um, if you send a quote and you don't hear anything back. Um, because there could be all kinds of reasons that they don't respond. I tell the story a lot of one time when I had a small business approach me and I gave them sort of my range and I didn't hear back. And I was like, yeah, that's because it's a small business. It doesn't have the money, blah, blah, blah. And I followed up a week later and said, Hey, I, I wanted to check in. I sent that. Do you have any questions? And they got back to me like immediately and was like, oh my gosh, I thought I sent this email and I didn't, it was in my drafts folder and they wanted to work with me and we worked together and it was great. So you don't know, don't make, don't write the story in your head that they can't afford you or they ghosted you or whatever you're doing. Follow yeah, up, nothing let them talk. Yeah. yeah. Like I had one, have one client and no matter what she does, all my emails end up in her spam folder and so if she hasn't like now I know but to start with I was like oh you know that's a shame and then you know and then I sent another follow up and nothing and then she happened to check her spam folder and she's like oh my goodness I thought you hadn't replied like and, I, <laughs> and you know these, these things can happen you know yeah but 100% it was, yeah it worked out in the end you know but thankfully I sent you know a couple of follow-up emails like maybe a week later and then maybe three weeks later because there was a client that I really wanted to work with as well and you know it just so happened that you know she didn't see the first two but she saw the third one because once a month she went in and had a look at her spam folder you know yeah so. yeah that follow-up I I think yeah that's so important because you don't, yeah, you just, you really don't know. And I think that's something that we do. I mean, all humans do, not just designers or entrepreneurs or whatever, but we write these stories in our head about what is really happening on the other end of something we don't know anything about. And we tend to write the negative story rather than the positive mm -hmm. story. It's, it's not a, it's not the story that she didn't respond because she's too busy, like planning an even bigger project for you. It's, she didn't respond because she hates me and she thinks I'm useless and I can't, you know, <laughs> which is like horrible, but you know, either way it's, we're making it up. It's absolute fiction. So 
you know, until we get hear back from anyone, we can't make that assumption. So. Any other negotiation tips or, or things that we want to hit on today? I really like Portia's suggestion about keeping it like a conversation. I think that's a really, you know, that's a good, good approach, you know? Yeah. And you're building a, building a relationship with a client too, you know, it's important to think as a, one of our other, our third point of thinking long-term, you know, you, the more you build a relationship with a client, the more you get to know each other, you know, the more likely it is to, to be a long and successful relationship too. So that's really important. Yeah. You're right. Yeah, it's just another human at the other end of the email. Mm -hmm. um, and I do like the idea of trying to talk on the phone if you can. You know, mm -hmm. people are busy, but that's because that also helps cultivate the relationship. Well, so think about terms. You know, you can always, if you can't get the number to move, think about the terms. Um, confident, stay confident. Don't write, don't make things up in your head or at least you shut down whatever you're making up in your head and, you know, find that uh, plug in, just not sorry, so that your language is, you know, more confident and, and, you know, feel, understand that it is, it is something that you, that is expected. The, the back and forth is expected. You're not doing something wrong to, to say, I'm not comfortable with that first number. That's totally fine. And um, yeah, remember that it's just, you know, another human on the other end. And we're all just, you know, doing our best, trying to make a living. So they're, you know, working together and building that long-term relationship is super important. Um, and you're not being, you know, uh, hard to work with just because you are standing your ground on what your artwork is worth. Thank you guys for your insights. I really appreciate um, all the all the things that you guys are doing to help make uh, pricing easier for surface designers. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Silver, and I've been a professional surface pattern designer for almost two decades. And my favorite stories are how designers discovered this career path. The stories are always so unique, and it's almost always a serious light bulb moment. Tell me if this sounds familiar. You might have a stack of fun patterned scrapbook paper in your desk, even though you don't scrapbook like me. You may have bins of fabric or a collection of beautiful notebooks with no plans to use them. Once you realize how much you love the pattern and illustrations you see on products, you probably realized, hold on, maybe I could do that. Light bulb, right? So you've started developing art that would be perfect for bedding or greeting cards or gift wrap, or probably all three. But it's harder than you thought to start bringing in income with your art. Your portfolio is looking good, but connecting with companies that actually want your art is tricky. Trust me, I know. When I left my in-house design job to run my own business, I had a lot of industry experience, but building a strong client base still took way longer than I expected. And part of that was because there's both a lot and not enough information out there about how to do this. You've been down the Google rabbit hole, you know. Fast forward to now when I sometimes turn down client work because I'm booked solid. It's for that exact reason that I created Start Your Surface Pattern Business. In this course, I help you cut through the overwhelm and give you a super clear path to becoming a paid surface pattern designer. I provide you with the tools you need to focus on your goals, get yourself set up so you make a killer first impression, and then find and pitch the clients that are right for your artwork. And I do it in the most straightforward, simple way possible. Nothing extra, just distraction-free lessons and to-do lists. Plus insights from an industry insider that will help you get the confidence you need to move forward. The most exciting thing is hearing from my students about landing their first client or licensing contract as they start taking the proactive approach that I am such a fan of. You don't need to spend years building a portfolio of hundreds of patterns and illustrations, and you don't need to get stuck comparing yourself to artists on Instagram. What you need is to take concrete steps forward to build the career that you want and start your surface pattern business is all about taking imperfect action. If you've got a portfolio of designs that you've been building and you're ready to level up, enroll to get started today.